but there's a lot of industry leaders that are causing a, a stir. Um, and they're saying a whole lot of things, doing a whole lot of things. And for the first time ever, um, I am a third generation real estate practitioner, you know, fourth generation Cameron is coming up right behind me. And even Ellie has been the, the two year old grandbaby um, already wears a, a future boss, uh, you know, real estate shirt around. So um, I have a vested in interest in this industry, not because it pays my bills, but because I love this industry. I think that it has a lot to offer to consumers, but for the first time in my life, I'm slightly ashamed of it. And it's not that I'm ashamed because of the things the media says we should be ashamed of. It's because all of this stuff has brought to the forefront the amount of stupidity going around the real estate industry leaders and the things that they're saying publicly that are wrong that make us look bad. So for anybody that'll listen, I want to clear the air because I care too much about the industry. I care too much about my agents, like everybody that would ever care to hear the sound of my voice. And I care way too much about consumers to just sit around and wait for all this to pass. I keep seeing people say, oh, this is just the next thing and it's going to blow over and nothing's going to change. Well, some things need to change. Um, and this is what we're going to chat about. So first off, if you have no idea what's happened, this is what actually happened. So a few years ago, National Association of Realtors was sued. They were sued by a joint effort um, spearheaded by the Department of Justice, well, really spearheaded by some attorneys that got paid shit tons more than real estate agents ever would, but that's a whole other podcast, I guess. Um, but they got paid by a whole bunch of people, a group of people that saw a target that they could attack and they went straight to the top of the food chain. They didn't go to individual brokers initially. They went to the largest franchisees, the, the big national, like the McDonald's of real estate. They went straight to the National Association of Realtors and a little handful of the biggest brokerages across the nation, and they sued them for a whole lot of things. The claims against them was that agent involvement in the real estate practice inflated home prices. They also claimed that there was an industry standard of commission and that nobody could ever do away with it. And they also claim that sellers were being forced to pay buyers agents. So that was the, the primary, there's a whole lot more to it. It was like hundreds and hundreds of pages, but that was the primary, you know, uh, takeaway from the initial lawsuits. So what ended up happening was they won that the suit was lost by NAR in those brokerages. Now, again, a lot of the stuff that was said in that, um, I honestly, and, and somebody recently on social media called me an NAR bot, um, because some people believe that you should be a part of the National Association of Realtors. Some people think you can sell real estate independently of them. We're not here to talk about that. Um, but I was called like an, an NAR drone because I was defending a, a couple of things and really speaking against the stupid people in a, in a real estate group. But that's a whole other thing, too. Um, but the suit was, in essence, lost. On record, it looks like it was lost by NAR and those brokerages they initially sued. Some brokers decided to settle for a whole lot of money, like millions and millions and millions of dollars. Now, we're talking about like giant conglomerate, like I said, the McDonald's of real estate that had the money to pay themselves out of these lawsuits, thinking we'll just settle this and we'll be out. We can't be sued anymore and we'll be done with it. Other brokerages decided to stay and keep fighting the lawsuits because it was never said that we did anything wrong. NAR has never admitted that we did anything wrong as an industry. These brokers never admitted that we did anything wrong as an industry. We basically conceded to saying, we get what you're saying and you have enough people behind you that y'all aren't going to go away if we don't throw some money at you. So we're just going to not admit want wrongdoing, but we backed out, paid money, and that was pretty much it. Well, National Association of Realtors just last week decided to settle the entire thing. And that's what has put this back into the, the forefront again. Because what happened with National Association of Realtors last week is that they decided to settle a suit again, or the, the, the Department of Justice has brought in a way that protects everybody else. So 
Um, there's, there's lots of things that have been missaid that we'll talk about in a second. But one of the biggest things it says, and this is copied and pasted from the, the part of that link that's in the group chat that y'all can all take a look at. Um, it says two critical achievements of this resolution are the release of most NAR members and many industry stakeholders from any liability of these matters. Um, and the fact that cooperative compensation remains a choice for consumers when buying or selling a home. Now, remember, I told you already all the things that they were saying in that initial lawsuit. I also said that NAR did not admit any wrongdoing. So what has happened this last few days since this this uh, settlement was handed out on Friday is the the media has had a freaking field day with it. And you can Google things like no more 6% commission, the end of buyer's agency. I mean, you can Google anything to do with realtors and all that's going to come up is this stuff that's being said. And I hate to say, all you got to do is log into some real estate related groups and misinformed people are saying things as well that come from a lack of knowledge of how our industry works. Um, and it's just led to this giant dumpster fire of these things being said that are making the real estate practice in general look bad. So again, I just want to address some of those things. So a little real estate history lesson first. First off, when we teach pre-license, one of the found tonight actually in pre-license class is all about agency, the word agency. Now, most people think agency is the company, right? In real estate, agency is any time you work on someone else's behalf. And everything that we do in real estate is about working on other people's behalf or agency relationships, as we call it. And an agency relationship in real estate is supposed to be in writing. We're supposed to have written agreements to be able to market your property. We have to have a written agreement to be paid by you to do services on your behalf. But those written agreements that we sign are called agency agreements. So back in the day, I'm talking like pre-90s, in the original foundational concept of real estate, everybody represented the seller. So if you're a fairly new agent and you're spouting off things about what's changed, whatever, if you weren't around back then and you haven't taken the time to learn that history, just stop. Because back in the day, everybody represented the seller. Now, again, we're, we're building, and this is really important. This isn't me wasting time. You won't understand what's going on if you don't know the progression of how the real estate industry started and how it's changed. So all agents brokers represented the seller. Now, imagine you're the buyer and you're riding around in your real estate agent's car and you're telling them all about your life and they know how much money you have and they know that this house you looked at is listed for back then, you know, $70,000 and you'd be willing to pay $75,000 for it if you really had to, but you're going to try to get it for sixty. dollars but you know, something you just felt your grandma's presence when you walked into the house and I know it's the house for me. Well, back then as a buyer, you didn't realize that your real estate agent had a legal obligation to the seller to get them the best possible terms possible. So you're spilling your heart to your buyer's agent. You thought whoever is carting you around, you're giving all your personal information to, they take that information right back to the seller and they were legally allowed to say something like, you're, I know you're listed for 70, they're going to offer 60, but they've already said they're going to pay 75. And legally, there was nothing wrong with that. We think today's crazy. That was crazy. So just like attorneys in the courtroom, the industry decided that buyers need to have their own representation. But remember, I said agency starts with agreements, right? We sign contracts. Typically, back in those days, since a longstanding custom was if I charge 50 chickens to sell a house because there's no industry standard. We're going to talk about that in a minute too. If I decide I'm going to build my business charging 50 chickens to sell a house, I would have that agreement with the seller that you're going to pay me 50 chickens when I sell the house. Since I cooperate with all the other agents out there, if one of them sells the house with me, I'll give them 20 of my chickens, or I could give them 25 of my chickens, or I could give them 40 of my chickens. Doesn't matter how many chickens I give them, but I would have that conversation up front with the seller, and we would have a signed agreement of how much we get paid as a listing brokerage, 
And then we would also have some kind of agreement as to whether or not I'm willing to share the compensation you've agreed to pay me with the agent who brings the buyer into your front door. And we called that being sub agents of the seller, because again, everybody worked on behalf of and in the best interest of the seller. So buyers needed their own representation. Listing agents continue to share their contractual fee. That's how it's always been. The seller pays the money out of their proceeds at closing, and they're willing to do that. It helps the buyers. We'll talk about that more in a little bit. But the sellers agreed to that fee that would come out of their proceeds, and the listing agent agreed that we would share whatever we wanted to of that fee with the other um, buyer's agents. Part of the common practice, and you can't see this if you're, you know, general public logging in, you can't see this when you go to like Zillow or even if you go to like our company websites and look at listings, but part of our private remarks was that if you're coming to my house and I've agreed to pay you 40 chickens or 25 chickens or five chickens or no chickens, that would be listed in MLS so that you would know what, if anything, you're being compensated for bringing the buyer to help show the house. And that's how it's been for as long as I can remember MLS. I've been licensed since 95 when we used to print houses out on dot matrix printers and we had MLS books, like phone books. I've still got around here somewhere. That's how it's been for as long as I've been involved in the, in the industry. We have just shared that, that compensation. One of the issues now is that people have forgotten that being compensated, compensation doesn't equal representation. One of the foundational concepts of the real estate industry, and especially the National Association of Realtors, is that we offer representation to clients on a broad scale, that every potential buyer, potential seller deserves to be represented and have their best interest stated by a real estate professional working on their behalf. Who pays us is not supposed to have any bearing on who we're representing. Have you ever been to court for anything and the opposing party end up having to pay your attorney's fees? Well, they're the one that got the settlement, whatever, and that was how it was decided. Well, our industry decided a long time ago that it's in the best interest of the buyer and the seller that agents all work together. That's why things like pocket listings are illegal. We see people posting things all the time. We'll sell your property ourselves before it ever even hits the market. Well, that means instead of the whole industry having access to your listing, about this many people have access to your listing, that's not supposed to be a thing. You're supposed to have full industry support from every local real estate agent as soon as you list a house, if you're a member of the National Association of Realtors. So, Next thing on our little real estate history lesson. Oh. So one of the things that's been, um, that's come out from the media um, is that this lawsuit has changed the industry. So this is copied and pasted from that 2024 Code of Ethics. Now, you see that it says 2024. One of the things I've, I've Googled all these headlines, I've read so many articles over the weekend that I had to do this because I, my blood pressure was going through the roof. My husband probably 10 times over this weekend has said, are you here? Are you here? No, my mind has been here. This is where it's been. But one of the industry things or one of the news articles says, we fought them so hard and we've counterbalanced all of their horrible practices and we are changing the industry. Um, we've They've said things about cooperating with other brokers and that we're supposed to work better together and that we're supposed to give. Do you see the date on this? 1995. This lawsuit, these this stuff that's happening, it's definitely media clickbait, but it hasn't changed the industry. We're going to talk about some of the changes and some of the reasons that on a national level, it might seem like there's some giant changes going on. Some of our people that are joining, like Jeremy, from which state did you say you were? I called off the wrong state earlier. Um, but he's joining from another state that it has a big impact on just because of the way that they practice real estate. We're going to talk about that in a minute. But one of the big things is that they're saying the lawsuit has dramatically changed the industry. I feel like that is 100% a scare tactic. Again, we'll talk about that towards the end. 
But some of the things that have happened to change, you know, I got a, a call from a buyer and she's been, you know, kind of waiting. She's got a house to sell. She's got another one she's going to buy. This is, you know, we've been talking probably two years over the weekend. She said, I think I waited too late. Now I'm not going to be able to buy. I've been struggling to save money and I've got my credit built up and, you know, and now I'm, I'm not going to be able to pay you and pay my closing costs. And I read an article that said that sellers can't help me pay my closing costs anymore. Like, I just don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to be stuck here forever. I was like, calm down, crazy. Like that, that's not e like none of that is even a thing. Absolutely none of that is a thing. So it's important to know what's fact and what's not. So one of the big things about misinformation in the media is that the industry as a whole is changing, that we're going to revamp the way that we do things so that we can serve clients better. It's absolutely not the case. I've literally read the majority of the lawsuit because most of it's BS and I've skimmed full disclosure, but I've read every bit of the settlements. I've read way too many articles. I've listened to literally hundreds of hours at this point, my husband can verify, of YouTube videos by trusted industry leaders, like at the top of the food chain, not Facebook famous people that have never read anything and all they're doing is requoting um, headlines. I've, I've read this stuff and I feel like I'm pretty competent to share it with you guys. So the industry as a whole is not changing. It's just not. One of the things that they've said is that NAR has always upheld a standard commission rate. First thing, and again, you've got a copy of the Code of Ethics. It tells you several times, I didn't even quote them all because I would run out of space on my little PowerPoint. But several times it talks about commissions being no negotiable. There is no set standard that you, the amount of compensation is up to an agreement between you and the broker and the agent that you're working directly with. It has always been like that. There's never been an industry standard. And whenever I said in the beginning that this is the first time I've been super ashamed of my industry, it's mainly because of this one, because my opinion is that the reason for these lawsuits in the first place is because a lot of agents has never been properly trained how to represent buyers and sellers and the right conversations we're supposed to have with those buyers and sellers. And it's common practice. I have sat in the room with people that literally, I don't know how my face didn't explode, while these trainers are telling people whenever a new agent says something like, well, I had a seller the other day that said that they didn't want to list because they only want to pay two chickens to sell the house. And I know that that's not something I should do. So how do I get them to, you know, pay me more money if I'm going to sell their house or this for sale by owner said I can just list it for free and they'll pay me, you know, $200 to put it in the MLS. The trainer for this company with hundreds of agents in it said, well, that's easy. Just tell them everybody pays 6%. I'm going to say it now because it's on the news all over. You know, it's actually illegal that we get together and talk commissions. But since it's in a headline, I'll go ahead and say it. But these real estate trainers are telling people, well, just tell them that it's a standard. Everybody gets paid the same percent. It's not. It never has been. I've gotten paid everything from zero on a house because if you're in a hardship, I'll suffer that hardship through you, girlfriend, but you just send me referrals later and we'll call it a day. I've gone from zero. I've charged 12%. I've gone above that and had to do remodeling. There's no set standard. It's between you as a client. And now some brokers have set brokerage policies that their agents can stand on and says, my brokerage won't let me charge less than X without their approval because there are some fees and things involved. And again, we need to make sure, you know, I love doing this as a service. I love helping buyers and sellers, but at the same day, at the same time, if you're making money off the transaction, it's only fair that we all get to make money off the transaction. But there's never been an industry standard of commissions farthest from this from the case. If you want to take a note and you've forgotten it from pre-license, if you're a real estate agent, Google something called the Sherman Antitrust Act. Again, as long as I've been in real estate and as long as I've been teaching it, which was 2008, Sherman Antitrust Law has been a federal law that 100% prohibits what's called price fixing, which is people getting together in big groups saying that there's a standard price. What would happen if all the dairy farmers got together and said, we're going to start charging $15 a gallon for milk and we all had to pay that? Walmart can set their price. Fresh Market can set their price. Little farmer down the road, I'll pay him $25 a gallon because it's fresh from the cow and it comes in a little mason jar. That's the glory of America. I get to choose what I pay and where I want to get my watered down milk 
from. And just like that, you get to choose as a consumer how much you want to pay an agent based on the level of service they're going to provide to you and how much value you think that agent is going to bring to your transaction, which a properly trained agent will do. So as a consumer, it's up to them to decide how much their agent is worth to them because contrary to what some agents think, because that's the only way they know how to get somebody to sign a contract. And I'm sorry, I love my newbie agents. You know, my heart is training agents. I absolutely love it. But some of these nationwide groups with 75,000 real estate members spouting off dumb shit has driven me absolutely insane, a hundred percent insane. And it really needs to stop. I'll also say that the main reason that all this junk happened is because they get in those groups and they copy and paste the stupid things we say and use it against us. If you've ever been properly trained and you know how to assess your value in a situation, I'm sitting here, I'd say I'm not going to pay attention to the list. There's an ex-client of mine right now that we, during the process of everything, the amount of extra attention to detail and above and beyond that happened to them. She's very involved with me still. She's one of my biggest cheerleaders. I can't tell you how many referrals that she sent. That is the value of a good agent. And it's up to consumers to decide how their agent's going to work with them. So what other misinformation's out there? One, that sellers can no longer pay a buyer's agent. I've heard that from so many people. I've seen it posted on websites. I've seen it in these social media groups where agents are saying, oh my gosh, what are we going to do now that agents can't pay buyers commissions anymore? It, it's, it's not it's nowhere in there. It's 100% wrong. It's misinformation. There is nowhere ever in any of this that said that sellers are not going to be allowed to pay a buyer's agent. It is false. It's wrong. Can't count how many times it's in the headlines. Wall Street Journal had an article about it. It is 100% wrong. It's not there. Next, that buyers are now going to have to have the cash to pay their own agent because the sellers can't buy the agent's cost. It's absolutely 100% not there. It's misinformation. It's wrong. Next misinformation in the meeting. You can Google these headlines that the concept of buyers having an agent is not going to be allowed anymore. That buyers are going to be left to their own devices, that agents will be able to list houses, get paid to list a house, and buyers are going to be 100% on their own. We changed the industry in 95, remember? We changed it in the 90s, long, long, long ago when buyer's agency was added because the reasons I told you it was added. We won't do away with that. It's not going to be done away with because just like attorneys in the courtroom, buyers deserve representation as well. We aren't doing away with buyer's agency. There's some countries, Australia doesn't have buyer's agents. Last I heard, they're still doing it the way we were pre-1990s. Everybody represents the seller. And I'm sorry, I was in that market. I was a kid working for my mom, but I was in that market and I'm in it now. You will never convince me that it's a better service to the agents or a better service to the customers, consumers to not have their own representation. I would never go into divorce court knowing that my soon-to-be ex-husband has a really high-powered, strong negotiator of an attorney, and I just walk in saying, well, hey, judge, you know, just bless me if you can, buddy. That's stupid. It's never going to, that reversal of our industry will never happen. It's not going to happen. So, so buyers, you still deserve to have representation. You're always going to have representation. I don't see that ever changing. Next, that the new rules are going to limit broker agent compensation. One of the big headlines, it said 6% commission is a thing of the past. I don't know what past you're living in, buddy, because it was never a thing. Stupid agent said it was a thing to try to withstand their commission. Did you know on national average, the average that brokers get paid in general is closer to 5%? 6% has been gone for a long time, and it really wasn't ever a thing. Back in the day when houses were forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 it was, but there's a ton of different different brokerage models. I mean, there's written sliding scales. It is up to every broker and every agent to negotiate out what they believe they are worth directly to their clients. Again, every broker can have a policy in place, or at least in Georgia, 
individual brokers can have a policy in place as to what the agents within their brokerage are charging. Just like, again, you know, you go down the road to Swank, little clothing store, they set the price for the shirts they wear. You can go five doors down to another clothing store. You might be able to get a $10, a $10 discount. Wait long enough, it's going to be on the clearance rack. I don't know about you, but I don't always want to shop on the clearance rack. Sometimes I like paying top dollar for my steak that came from the fresh market instead of shopping at Walmart with the little purple tags over the top of it. We all have the right to make those choices ourselves. Yay, America. All right. Now, whenever I keep saying that in some areas it's going to make a difference, remember we talked about that whole buyer representation thing. Most people don't realize this is as of, of December 2023. Only eight 18, 1 8, only 18 states require written buyer agency agreements. If you're in Georgia or you're in Arkansas, Alaska, Ohio, Idaho, Maryland, all of these states, and you're seeing all this national news causing a stir, your state is not changing at all. There's absolutely zero to do with any of this. It's even going to affect you if you live in one of these 18 states because they've already had a long-standing policy of having written buyer agency agreements where we've always said since the 90s that states should have separate representation available for the buyers. Why does, does is this a thing? Now, remember, this lawsuit, I said, they went to the top of the food chain. Every state has individual licensing authorities. Georgia, Georgia Real Estate Commission, South Carolina, South Carolina LLR. We all have our own licensing authority. It's the difference between you having a driver's license and you deciding to join the country club. So once you are licensed to practice in that state, you're bound to follow the license law in the state that you're licensed in. National Association of Realtors, there's an Augusta Association, Aiken Association, there's a Georgia, there's an Association of Realtors in every state. You can opt in and out of joining them depending on your brokerage policies, depending on the rules set by those associations, but there's different associations of realtors. The National Association of Realtors is the largest trade organization in the United States with over, I think, 1.6 million members last time I Googled it. So that it's huge. Like I said, top of the food chain. They didn't go to little independent brokers like me. And I'm hoping I'm not putting a target on myself with my little, you know, 35 biggest we've ever been is 55 agents. They didn't bother with people like me. They went to the top of the food chain. They went straight to NAR. You realize that a large percentage of licensees aren't even members of NAR. So that 1.6 million is just the people that have joined them. There's a ton of people that don't have anything to do with them. But since every state can have its own laws, National Association of Realtors says, you know what, I don't necessarily care what your state law says. The very top thing you'll see in that code of ethics that we're governed by for members of the Association of Realtors, the top thing says that if the code of ethics dif differs from your state law, like don't break the state law to follow our rules. Our rules are a code of ethics, ethical behavior, how the National Association of Realtors feels that we should should act whenever we're in conversations and dealings with consumers and clients and public. You'll see it all in the code. That's why I loaded it. But National Association of Realtors across the board has said again since the early 90s that we should advocate for representation separately of buyers and sellers. But up until December of 2023, only 18 states required a written buyer agency agreement if we are representing buyers. So that's why I keep saying things like people like Jeremy in the state that he's in is going to be in for a change because you've never had to sit down and talk to a buyer about the possibility of representing them. You've never had to even have a conversation with a buyer that says, you know, you can pay me independently or you can count on the seller to pay me. Another thing that was misinformation is that the sellers have always been required to pay a buyer's agent's fee. It's always been optional to sellers in their listing agreements, like I said, and we can share them. And again, one of the problems in NAR, again, it's, I, I had it, um, a screenshot, and I think I, that was the one that missed the, the presentation. 
But back in 2020 or 2021, there was another update to the code that says that, because again, mistraining by people that don't know how to do business correctly, they've long since told buyers things. And I've seen it on billboards right here in Augusta, Georgia. I'll be your buyer's agent. It won't cost you a thing. My services are free to you. National Association of Realtors took it so seriously that we weren't doing things the right way because for a long time, it's been a rule. They actually said in 2020, that's not a result of this lawsuit. It was happening already. National Association of Realtors says, y'all shouldn't be saying that. Don't tell people our services are free to them because they're not. Somebody is paying for it. And if the seller decides not to pay, the buyer can pay you directly. That is something that hasn't changed as of like, you know, this lawsuit. It hasn't changed as of the settlement on Friday. It has always been like that. The majority of realtors just didn't bother to read the code. And they weren't ever trained properly in the first place to tell buyers, yes, in most cases, the seller has agreed to pay the real estate commission for both sides. But what if you buy for sale by owner? What if you end up buying your next door neighbor's house? Last year, I counted up six transactions where we got paid to help a buyer buy a house that was never even listed on MLS. One called and said, I've been renting the same house for 10 years and the seller wants to sell it. Could you help me with the paperwork? I would be more than happy to pay you. I have no idea what I'm doing but I definitely want to buy the house I've been renting for 10 years. So we got paid a fee to help that buyer buy the house he was already living in where he had an established relationship for 10 years with the owner. So it's not a new concept that we can get paid directly by buyers to do a service specifically for them. Again, it's lack of creativity and agents and professionalism because they haven't known those rules or they haven't exercised them, but that is not a recent change at all. In all of these states, we've had written agreements for years. I had somebody that piped up the other day, and I think they were in Missouri, that says, we've had those agreements, but we've never used them. Like speechless. And you know, that takes a lot for me to, I don't even know what to say to that. Like, how did you get a real estate license if you missed that whole part of real estate law? I just, I don't even understand. Anyway, like I said, first time in the history of my industry that I've been so upset and it has nothing to do with what we've done wrong other than some stupid things that uneducated people are saying, which is why I'm here. All right. So all of that stuff that we said is misinformation. Sellers can and even more pay buyers agents. Buyers have to have, none of that is anywhere in there at all. It's not even a part of any of the, 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 the precepts of the settlement. What is happening, and actually I'll just back up on that for a second. So what is actually happening is NAR did agree on a settlement this past Friday. NAR decided, because I told you originally it was National Association of Realtors and a bunch of the bigger conglomerate national chain um, in the industry, they were sued and some of them settled out. Some of them stayed in the fight. This past Friday, though, there was a settlement reached directly by National Association of Realtors because what has happened is that all of these what I call copycat lawsuits have popped up everywhere. In different states have had different, We I was in a uh, broker chat last uh, Thursday and independent brokerage owners from all over just joined in to say, you know, what are your, this was before the NAR settlement. And I'm telling you, I've, I've been terrified for about six months. You know that your mailman could fall off your front porch delivering a package to your front door and sue you because he fell on your property. Like we live in a very sue happy era where anybody can sue anything, anybody for anything. Doesn't mean you did anything wrong. And a lot of times the attorneys will say, you know what, if you want to keep it out of the court how, courtroom, just settle, you know, give them a couple thousand dollars, make them go away. Well, and that's what happens in a lot of lawsuits. Doesn't necessarily mean you did anything wrong, but we're paying to make you go away. What National Association of Realtors did was they said that, that they would pay a settlement a lot of money, uh, $414 million to be paid out over the next four years, that they would pay that settlement to make it all go away, not admitting any fault at all. But one of the guidelines was all these copycat um, lawsuits have shown up. Georgia had one filed recently, Better Homes and Gardens, the, the, the biggest Better Homes and Gardens in um 
and uh, Atlanta was named in it. Ryan Serhant, if you've ever followed him on TV, he's got an, a Georgia brokerage. His name was named in it. There was like seven different companies that were all named in this Georgia suit. There's one in South Carolina. There's one in Florida. I know the ones recently. Almost every state has had these copycat lawsuits. And actually, I left it downstairs, but most of y'all have gotten little postcards in the mail that have, you know, the, the you know, call us if you've sold a house. There's all these lawsuits popping up, jumping on the bandwagon, just trying to sue people. So we don't necessarily want that to happen. NAR decided to put a stop to it. And they said, we will, you know, here, hold my beer for a minute. I'm just going to go ahead and agree to stroke a check that's going to protect everybody else. Again, looking at my friend Lloyd DeFore, absolutely adore him, owns DeFore Realty. You know, not promote my own company, hadn't even said it one time, but absolutely love Lloyd. We have lots of agents we work with, lots of brokerage, but us small guys have been a little scared. So on this broker meeting last week, there was a guy from Florida that was in, randomly got picked for this lawsuit. He said, I don't even know why. He's like, we're not a giant firm. We don't do tons of business. But his lawyer had said that he would end up paying close to $750,000 in fees alone if he stuck with this lawsuit because they're dragging it out, dragging it out, and dragging it out, dragging it out. And he said, or you can settle it for, you know, they, they'd probably take four or $500,000 as a settlement if you want to settle the lawsuit. Dude said, the only place I have that type of cash to settle anything is sell my house, sell the building our brokerage is in. Like I would be, a I mean, this dude tears in his eyes is saying, like, I'm done. Like I'm 100% done. I've, I've lost it all if, if this lawsuit comes against me directly just because he owns a real estate brokerage and he got caught up. He hasn't done anything specifically wrong. These copycat lawsuits are just popping up in every state, naming whoever it is that they want to name. And God, please protect me from like the target. This is 100% for information. I don't want them to come after me. I would prefer to slide under the radar. But if this settlement from NAR gets approved, what they've said is everybody stop. Nobody else can get sued. Everybody who has been a member of the National Association of Realtors that made less than $2 billion in gross commission, or I'm sorry, uh, less than $2 billion in gross sales, like sales prices added up. So less than $2 billion worth of, um, uh, and I'm losing the word, say it every day, volume of sales volume, less than $2 billion in 2022 would be covered under this NAR settlement, which means all of us little guys are protected. We don't have to wake up every morning afraid to go to our mailboxes like we have been for the last six months or so when all these copycat, the, the day I got the postcard in the mail saying if you've bought or sold a house and whatever, it, it was reality to me, like this is coming. They're literally sending things to every single mailbox in the United States trying to get people to get on board for these lawsuits. And it even says, even if you're perfectly happy with the service that you got from your agent, call us anyway, because you might be entitled to some money. So the NAR settlement just stopped all of that. Everybody is protected. Another thing that I didn't want to put it on there because I didn't want a screenshot of it to make me look bad. But another thing that's being said is that since there were certain brokerages excluded from the settlement, that those brokers are bad. One of them I'll name is Ber the um, uh, Home Services. And there's lots of big, you know, shelter companies that have lots here locally. We have Berkshire Hathaway Home Services. They're, they are not a bad company. Of course, they're owned by Warren Buffett. Of course, that's going to be a target for any giant lawsuit. And again, you know, there's good and bad in every industry. There's good and bad real estate agents, good and bad brokerages. But one of the media buzz is that home, sh home services must be this horrible company because NAR excluded them from their settlement. The only reason they were excluded was because part of the settlement was anybody, remember I said that some people opted out and already settled on that first lawsuit. Home services was one of the ones that decided to stay and battle it out to try to clear their name altogether to say nobody in our industry has done anything wrong. They decide to stay and fight, so they were excluded from the NAR settlement. So this recent thing saying there's certain people that are bad and certain people are not, you know, this company is so bad that National Association of Realtors doesn't even want to protect them. It's bull. That is absolutely not what has happened. But for everybody else, all of us little guys... National Association of Realtors has stepped up and said, we're going to save all these little brokers from all these lawsuits. Nobody can file any more lawsuits if we agree to pay out this $418 million over the last four years. Personally, 
it is the biggest weight lift off me as a small local brokerage owner since all this crap started. It's been huge. It's been insanely stressful, literally thinking every single day that I could lose my entire livelihood plus that of my children is involved as I am in the industry, hearing these other people that already have are in the process of losing everything because they've been involved in every state in these little co copycat lawsuits. It's been a big deal. So National Association of Realtors stepped up and protected all of us. So what are my personal thoughts on this? My personal thoughts, one, great agents are an asset to your transaction. I am so sorry to anybody in any shape, form, or fashion involved in the real estate industry. If you're an agent or broker who's never been properly taught how to talk to people, I am sorry that our industry as a whole has failed you. I teach pre-license. When you come out of pre-license, you are not prepared to run a real estate business in any state. It is up to the company that you work for and your individual broker, no matter what state you're in, to offer you training past pre-license, which means everybody can stand on a street corner and preach whatever fallacy they want to. And as long as they can draw in agents, it's perfectly acceptable because there's not a written standard of how everybody, I mean, there is, it's called the law and it's called the code of ethics, but there's not the accountability individually for agents that or for brokers to teach things a certain way. They're all kind of left to their own devices. So if you're a, a practitioner that's not been taught and trained properly, I'm sorry. It is a huge failure in our industry that, and, and there's no way it can be. You know, there's, we're, we're not McDonald's where every single person gets trained exactly the same way. Um, there, you know, that's why it's really up to your individual firm and the person leading that firm to make sure that you're in good hands to teach you the things that you're, that you're supposed to learn. I'm also sorry to all the consumers that think that we aren't valuable to the transaction because that tells me that you've only ever known or worked with crappy agents that didn't know how to properly represent you and do the best they possibly could for you. And I apologize that you haven't worked with somebody great. And I would be willing to bet that there are great agents in every single town, but it's not always going to be the one with the most Zillow reviews. It's not always going to be the one that's Facebook famous. Usually the best real estate agents come by referral from the person that says, you know, you might not see them on social media much, but whenever I sold my transaction or when my mom passed away and this was going on, this person really stepped up to the plate and went above and beyond the call of duty. Like that's the type of people that are going to keep this industry going the ones that aren't just in it for the money. And yes, we all have to get paid. We don't sell real estate as a hobby because some days, hate to say y'all definitely aren't worth it, but we don't do real estate as a hobby. So we all have to get paid, but our, our benefit to the transaction is supposed to be what keeps us in this business. Our job is to benefit the buyers. Our job is to benefit the sellers. One of the things that happened in the industry, they said that we were overinflating sales prices. You know where they got that from? Because there's an NAR statistic that says that homes sold by a real estate agent sell for typically 10% higher on average than, sold, than those sold by or for sale by owner. So they took the in the media took that that snippet that um you know that data and data can be manipulated to look like anything you want to say we inflate prices by ten percent it's absolute buyers wouldn't pay ten percent more than a house is worth on the market the reason that happens is because we've noticed that when you have a professional real estate agent representing you versus you selling on your own for sale by owner. You don't have a professional negotiator. You get more involved on uh, an emotional level to that transaction. And for sale by owners left for their own devices, sell homes for less than a professional negotiator would. It is, again, a benefit to us. And you say, well, on the flip side, y'all overinflated prices so buyers couldn't afford to buy houses. Again, appraisals won't happen if we just randomly jacked up prices. Supply and demand and the industry 
has helped this little housing bubble to, to go up. Agents don't set the prices. You know how many levels of checkpoint? We've got appraisers in the meeting today. Appraisers, if nobody else keeps pricing at bay because they work directly for the lenders and unless somebody's paying cash and you can pay whatever you want to with your cash, nobody cares. But if you're if you're willing to pay the price for a house, that's up to you again. Yay, America. But there is a system of checks and balances in place to make sure that agents don't overinflate prices. So again, that's a testimony to our value to the transaction, not that it's a bad thing. There's good and bad in every single profession. I honestly think this is going to weed out the bad and uneducated agents because the ones that are only talking about commissions or only talking about the woe is me or only talking about, oh, this is a brand new change. Whenever it's all revealed that it's been this way for the longest time and somebody counterbalances all the media BS that's going off, those people are going to look like the idiots that, that they are sometimes. I'm sorry. I love my industry. I love my agents, but I'm just tired of all the clickbait manipulation of all of these things without the truth coming out. Biggest reason why is my next thought that this is really just an attack on the American dream. I hate to say it, but media drives the market. Media drives the food market. You know, who would who ever heard of organic, you know, 15 years ago? Who ever heard that sugar was bad for you? I mean, I grew up thinking beef was the only form of protein. I've been downright vegetarian for the last six months because of a heart issue. Come on now. Like the media drives the market and it's always been that way. Um, every time there's a, a presidential election, every time anything happens and this isn't about, you know, politics, it's that what happens in the media, we follow. Why do you think they call them influencers? They call them influencers because they influence our thoughts and our actions. And if they weren't doing that, they wouldn't continue to make money. My thought is this is an attack on the American dream because the media drives the economy. And you know why else? And I hate to say it. But renters can be controlled. There is a giant drive right now to keep home ownership down to only a certain amount of people. And, and that, that's not how the industry is supposed to be set up. Renters can be controlled. Misinformation in the media is going to cause discrimination in the home buying process. All these people out there that are saying buy it, that the sellers can't pay my fees anymore and that the sellers can't contribute to my closing costs anymore. Who are those people? Who are those people? It's the lower income households. It's the minority households that have been struggling to get their credit back right that want to move out of the apartments they're renting. I had a client that's trying to move her way out of government housing. It's those people that are greatly affected because they're usually the same ones that are watching the news because they're looking for a source of information and we have to counterbalance that because it is going to cause discrimination. In our market in Augusta, Georgia, right outside of Fort Eisenhower, you know who else is going to be discriminated against? It's already popping up everywhere. I saw a notice the other day that says, if you're a veteran home buyer, you better buy quickly or your, your options are going to be limited. It's bullshit because in the grand scheme of things, again, the industry didn't change. But if you listen to the media stuff, veterans are out there saying, I mean, the whole purpose of my veterans loan is that I get 100% financing. You know, we live on a pretty tight budget when you are active duty military or a veteran. You know, we don't pay our guys that much. VA lending rules say that a seller is not allowed. It is not allowed. Via, and a lot of Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae thought, you're not allowed to contribute directly towards a veteran's real estate agent, which means veterans are saying, I'm either going to have to go at it alone or I'm going to have to call the seller's agent. Remember what we said about y'all deserving your own representation? So all the misinformation is going to cause discrimination because the misinformed agents and the misinformed sellers that are saying, I don't have to pay anybody else's fees now. They should be left on their own. If you're not a strong enough agent to have a conversation with that seller to say, yes, sir, you can definitely agree to pay whatever you want. But my company policy is that for as long as the majority of our business is done through veterans and FHA and first-time home buyers, I don't represent sellers who won't 
agree to compensate personally, I won't represent a seller who won't agree to compensate a buyer's agent because if so, you're eliminating lower income households, most minority households, veterans and first time home buyers. And I'm sorry, you can go find somebody else to work with. And I'm going to watch that corrugated plastic sign dry rot in your front yard that's going to be listed until Jesus comes back. Because if you decide to be selfish and do that, you're not doing yourself any service. The industry is set up this way to help the consumers. And if that changes, it's going to be a disservice to the industry. The last thing that's my thoughts is that I will always stand by my personal convictions. I might be wrong. I, I will put my, somebody can put my cell phone number, my email address. Y'all know where to find me on social media. Almost everything I do is public. My life is an open book. If you want to, if I'm wrong, please come correct me. And that's not a, hey, book up against me challenge. If I've misquoted something, we're right at 55 minutes of solid talking. I am 100% open to your feedback, your kickback. Put me in a cage if you need to. I'm open for it. But I will always stand by my convictions. And one of those is this, that clients are supposed to come first. Clients come before my paycheck. That's why compensation doesn't even equal representation. And I'm not just saying me. Our license law says it. Our code of ethics says it that clients are supposed to come before our personal agenda and that representing the clients that is supposed to be our number one top priority in everything that we do in the real estate industry. And I'm sorry that the media and some misinformed agents have made such a mockery of a system that is originally put in place to help people achieve the American dream. The whole point of owning a house is to be able to own it for a little bit and sell it and make money off of it. There's tax advantages to that. The only free money you can make in this society almost is selling your primary residence and making a profit off of it. You don't have to pay taxes on that. I mean, that's part of the American dream. And I firmly believe that renters can be controlled. And that is a big reason all this is happening. Do you realize how many outside investors are buying up hundreds and thousands of rentals in, in the nation? This hasn't been a short time coming. And I'm sorry, but this isn't because the realtors have done anything substantially wrong. It's an attack on the industry and it's an attack on independent home ownership. And and it's also an attack on the small guy that doesn't have enough money in the bank to get ahead in life to keep them bound up there if they sit there and listen to social media stuff all the time. It's not how it's supposed to happen. So um, before my husband comes up and tries to give me a nerve pill, that's everything that I had planned that I really wanted to say today. Thank you all for letting me get it off of my chest. There's now 55 of y'all that have logged in to hear um, my thoughts on things and hear what I had to say. I'm going to stop the recording at this point in just a second. I am more than welcome to stay here and unmute anybody that wants to chat with me, ask any questions. You can 100% still reach out to me if you want to discuss this further. You can call me, you can text me, you can email anything. Um, I definitely want to hear your thoughts. I want to hear what you have to say. Um, actually, will, will one of my admins please actually put my cell phone number? I know I said that. Y'all might have thought I was joking. Um, but if y'all will uh, put my, my cell phone number for anybody that might not have it. Again, I'm sure today might be a fiasco, but I'm definitely open to more conversations about this. If there's anything else we can do, again, since this is the first time I've ever done this at all, if there's anything else we can address, I'm a real estate dork. You know, I couldn't tell you the first thing about how to change the oil in my car, um, but if it's a real estate question, most likely I've delved into it. So I 100% um, am open. If y'all want me to talk about anything else, I'll get out of my comfort zone, start doing a little bit more of this. Like I said, I'll never be the person dancing on TikTok for entertainment purposes, but if I can educate somebody, I'm all about it. So again, I'm honored by the fact that y'all would take your time today and log in and listen to me. Um, I still fully believe in our industry. I still fully believe in the concept of home ownership and the benefits that it has to buyers and sellers. And I will be sticking. I don't have a plan B. 
Um, I believe that strongly in our industry and I'm um, excited to see, you know, how, how all this shakes out and hopefully, um, you know, very uh, interested to know your take on all this now that I've uh, hopefully cleared some of the, some of the smoke. So like I said, I'm going to stop um, recording. But I'm still going to be standing here if anybody wants to chat with me. That way, y'all just know that uh, anything you say can't and won't be used against you in court. Um, 